The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. After he was baptized by John, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and... On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Glory to you. Holy and gracious God, I speak in your name and in your presence, asking that my words would be pleasing to you, guided by your Spirit, and that the hearts and minds of your people would be open to you. Through Christ our Lord, I pray. Amen. So this morning, we begin the first Sunday of Lent, as we do every year with the story of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Always, Lent begins with this story. Now, I want to start by acknowledging the mythological character of this story. I think it's really important for us to grasp that. So oftentimes, we moderns will ask questions like, well, how did the devil take Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple? How did they get there? And where is that? And what would it be to stand on the pinnacle of the temple? And then we would say, but then how did the devil take Jesus to the high mountain? And where is that? And did anybody see him? And what they look like? You with me? And, I, and, I, and I, honestly, I think Matthew would say, What? What? Why would you ask that question? Now, not because the story is not true, but because it's more true than just an incident. Matthew would say, I'm telling a story about the fundamental principles of the way life is. I'm telling a story that's archetypal, in which we are all included. I'm telling the story that is the reality of the human experience and how Jesus faced that reality. Secondly, you've you've often heard me say that I think the gospel authors imagine that their stories are read repeatedly. And again, if you think about it, Matthew's story, which is long compared to Mark, But Matthew's story is, most Bibles, 30 to 35 pages, if you just have the story. It's an evening's read, right? I mean, less than a whole evening's read. Probably 30, 35 pages in most Bibles. You could read the thing through in two hours at most, and that's the whole story. 
But Matthew imagines that there's layers in his story. And that as you read it repeatedly, you say, oh, wow, yeah, that happened there and that happened there. And you start to connect the dots. So this temptation, this confrontation between Jesus and the Prince of Darkness ends on a, on a high mountain. Well, the story we had last week, the story of the transfiguration, was on a high mountain. Matthew's gospel ends on a mountaintop. And I think Matthew wants us to connect those dots. On the mountaintop of the transfiguration, the voice spoke, This is my beloved with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. In the wilderness, I think Matthew would say, It's not exactly what I call it listening to Jesus, but I would say, This is a story on a mountain, and I want us to learn to follow Jesus and the way that he faced the temptations of the human experience. And if you happen to notice in the, in the first line of the Gospel reading, it said, after Jesus was baptized by John. Well, the baptism is immediately preceding this story. Immediately preceding this story is the baptism of Jesus. And in that story, the heavens are rent apart and and again, it's a, it's a wonderful archetypal story. The heavens are ripped open and the Holy Spirit descends something like a dove upon Jesus and the voice speaks, this is my beloved with whom I'm well pleased. Now, now, now stay with me. So that story is the, is, the, is the story of the first Sunday of the season of the Epiphany. You remember this. If you've been coming, we've been, we've been telling this. The first, the Magi story is the Feast of Epiphany. The first Sunday is the story of Jesus' baptism. This is my beloved with whom I'm well pleased. The season of Epiphany ends with that other mountaintop experience. Jesus on top of the mountain and the transfiguration and the voice speaks again. This is my beloved with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And in between those two stories in the season of Epiphany, it's all about our awakening to who this Jesus is and who this Jesus as God is. And story after story, we're awakened to this divine one who is revealing to us who our God really is. And we see this life this life of remarkable benevolence and mercy. That's what happens to us in this season of Epiphany. This awakening to who our God is. So, so it's just... Matthew's Gospel begins with Emmanuel God with us. And the other mountaintop experience at the end of his gospel ends with, remember, I'm with you always. That's who our God is. The God who is with us and for us. And then that becomes very poignant at Jesus' baptism. You are my beloved with whom I am well pleased. That energy gives him the strength that he needs to face the temptation he's about to face. That's the dot that's so important to connect. And in, Mark, in Matthew's gospel, it says, immediately following his baptism, the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted. Mark's gospel says, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted. But remember something. This is so important. What the Spirit gave him was, you are my beloved it's like a divine kiss on the soul. You are my beloved. And what happens in the season of Epiphany and in the, fold, in the unfolding of the gospel, we're all invited to hear this as how God views the human family and the human situation. We are God's beloved. Now hear me. This is just, I, I probably don't have words for the urgency in my soul about this. Because 
we need that energy then to face the darkness. Isn't it fascinating? Here's Jesus at his baptism. And then immediately, he is led by the Spirit to face the darkness. Why? Because that's our mission. That's our mission, to receive the light of God, the epiphany, the unveiling of who our God is and who I am. And then, then, let the light that is in us dispel all the darkness. That's, the, that's how we're invited to follow Jesus in that way, of dispelling the darkness. Now, first of all, it's important to just note, in Jesus' life, the darkness was outside of him. It wasn't in him. That might not, actually, it, I'm sorry. In my case, it might not be true of you, but in my case, the darkness is in here. I've met the enemy, and it's in me. Yes? yes? And only to the extent that I have heard this word, you are my beloved, and been strengthened by this presence of the Spirit in my life, do I have the strength to really look into the mirror at the darkness and see it as something that this light and this love can dispel. Otherwise, I'm just defensive. Now, I know you don't think you are, but you're convinced the person next to you is. <laughs> and, and following Jesus is about the willingness to have this divine touch, this epiphany of being God's beloved, and then from that place, transform the world starting with me. Cast out the darkness, starting with me. And this really is, in Matthew's story, this is the, this is the archetype of the human adventure. This is the grand possibility of the transformation of the world, starting with the experience of the love of God, and then letting that love transform everything about me. And so Matthew gives us these themes, these three basic themes and the three temptations. It's, it's not, this is a sign of a classical understanding of the temptations. The first one is, by the way, Jesus has just finished fasting for 40 days. So if I may say it this way, the dude is hungry. I mean, you know, hadn't had anything to eat in 40 days. And the enemy tempts him by inviting him to use his powers to turn stones into bread. Now, remember, it's, it's an archetypal mythological story, and it's really important to hear it that way. Because you don't have the power to turn stone into bread, but you do have the power to satisfy your instinctual needs of hunger, yes? And you do have the ability to be driven by those needs, yes? You do have the ability to be over-attached to those needs, yes? And you do have the ability that, see, the, really that instinctual need of, of, of hunger connects to the whole instinct of the human person to feel like I will survive. I, I, will, I am safe in the world, and I will survive. And we all have the capacity to be totally over-identified with that need. Now, if you don't believe me, just think about it a minute. How much is enough to feel safe? It's very easy to be over-attached to that need. And to, if that need gets disturbed even a little bit, to be driven by the need rather than Jesus' response to the tempter is marvelous. One does not live by the instinctual need of hunger alone. One lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So just, there you are, in that moment where your sense of safety is being threatened. I don't mean, I don't mean safety from, 
from a malicious intruder or something like that. I mean, I mean a more basic sense, a sense of safety that, that my job will provide enough. A sense of safety that <laughs> there's been another economic downturn. Will my bank account hold up? Will my career make it? And in that moment, to be able to be led by the presence of the Spirit within rather than being driven to meet that need, that's what Jesus models in a spectacular moment. Second temptation is that the enemy takes Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple and says, throw yourself down. Be a great miracle worker and everybody will love you and they'll, they'll, they'll go, wow, look at this guy. I mean, you're the Messiah anyway, so just show it by, by, by doing this. And, and again, that, that speaks to the innate instinctive human need to be esteemed and valued and to have a good reputation. Yes? I love telling the story. One day, my beloved Betsy was disturbed. Her face looked despondent or something. I said, sweetheart, are you all right? She said, nothing mass adulation wouldn't fix. <laughs> Think about it a minute. How quickly life becomes driven by the need to be approved rather than being led by our God. Think about what it means to be in those moments or being over-identified with the instinctive need rather than being led by the Spirit of God. And finally, the enemy takes Jesus to the high mountain and says, throw your, fall down before me. Worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Now, I'm sure, I mean, well, first let me say, I know that, 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 that most of us are not driven by all the kingdoms of the world. Most of us. But I suspect you've had those moments where you thought, if I were king, if I were queen, if I were in charge, if I were the CEO, if I were the boss, yes? Yeah. And so it's the instinctive need to have power and influence or freedom. By the way, all of these needs, these instinctive human needs, are, are not bad in and of themselves. It's being over-identified with them that drives life rather than a life listening to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And, and that every word that proceeds from the mouth of God driving out the over-attachment to the instinctive needs which creates trouble and problem. I, I, I suspect for many of us it is the, the need to have things turn out the way we want them to. Right? You know, I, if they just listen to me, it'll all be okay. Right? And, 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 and if especially, especially if, I'm going to get in trouble here, but especially if my husband had just listened to me, he would realize my way's better. It's just better. See how this, this archetypal story of the human situation becomes so practical so quickly. Could we let go of our over-attachment too? If they just do it my way, it'd be okay to being willing to listen to the Word of God proceeding from a, the Spirit dwelling within our innermost being. Just listen to Jesus. Follow Jesus in living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's actually... It's actually very simple. Not simplistic, but simple. And so, a season of Lent, or the season of Lent, it's not about gritting your way through whatever discipline you might choose. It's about saying, what will help me follow Jesus 
and living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? What will help me listen to Jesus? How do I set these 40 days, set practices in these 40 days that will actually help me follow and listen? So I, I invited us to, to think about the mountaintops. On the mountain, Jesus is tempted by the enemy on the mountaintop. On the mountaintop is this moment of transfiguration and the words for us to listen to Jesus. And then the other mountaintop is at the end of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus appears to the disciples after the resurrection. It's the very final scene. And these words are glorious. Jesus appears to them and says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The very thing the enemy attempted to tempt him with. Or, or did tempt him with. And Jesus refused. All authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Go disciple all the nations and remember I am with you always. Matthew wants us to hear these mountaintop moments. Listen to Jesus. Listen to his resurrection presence in your innermost being. And you will have the victory of resurrection life. Even as Jesus had that victory of resurrection life. You will live life into the fullness of your divine nature within you. The fullness of the Holy Spirit living within you. Rather than being driven by your instinctual needs. It's just such... Such a dramatically different life. From that place, from that place, everything changes. Everything changes. had lunch with a very good friend of mine last week. He said, Jimmy, I, I have a long work day, and so I start my day really early. And I have a lot of needs, and he does. He's got a lot of challenges in his life, a lot of circumstances and situations, and a lot of challenges. And he said, so I start early, He's been doing, doing this for decades. And he said, recently, as I began my prayer, I began hearing the Holy Spirit give me the message for the day. And he said, some days the message is, I want you to be thankful. Receive everything in your day and have, a, have an attitude of thankfulness towards your day. Another day he said, I... The Spirit said to me, I want you to pray for your children. I want you today, your day to be about praying for your children. Another day he said, I want, you to, I want your day to be about praying for the people you work with. All day, I just want you to be in prayer for those people. And now here's the thing. He was being led by the word proceeding from the mouth of God, emerging from his innermost being, and that starting place brought him to peace through all of his day. It wasn't just about the specifics of that word. It was that it gave him this sense of presence and peace so that his day wasn't driven by his instinctive needs. And it, he said, it's just, it's fascinating, Jimmy. It makes, it makes all my interactions different. It creates a whole different aura in my day and in my life. What would help you do that? What would help us? What would help you live by every word proceeding from the mouth of God, following Jesus' example? Let that be your Lenten journey. 
Amen.